ladies and gentlemen. And let's get started with the second and the final session of the Strategy and Policy Day. I'm honored to present our next moderator, Dr. James Shires, who is an assistant professor uh, at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at the University of Leiden and holds a DPhil in international relations from the University of Oxford. Please, James, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here, and I'm very excited to be introducing our next panel. Uh, hi to everyone online dialing in. Uh, very glad you could be with us. This promises to be a really fantastic hours entertainment, but also in-depth, cutting-edge academic discussion. Uh, our panelists are the best people you could possibly hope to have on this sort of call, starting with Jay Healy. Jay Healy is a senior research scholar at Columbia University. He's got masses of private sector and public sector experience, and he's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, he's edited a really great book um, on cyber conflict, one of the classics in the domain called A Fierce Domain, and he's almost like a no knows, right? So he's right at the center of research on cyber conflict. Um, Without any further ado, we'll go straight to with our first presentation. We'll then go on to the next speakers who will talk for 10 to 15 minutes. And as before, I'll bring up written questions that can be submitted throughout after they've finished. Jay, the floor is yours. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you, James, for that great introduction. Um, good morning to those of you in my continent. Good afternoon to those of you on our host continent. Good evening to those um, joining in from Asia, really thrilled to be here. Uh, I first went to SciCon in 2009 and got to hear Martin Lubicki at that event um, and have been going pretty much steadily ever since 2009. And so disappointed uh, we won't be seeing all each other in Tallinn, but so glad that we can be seeing each other over the internet. The talk that I have done, I'm represent uh, the paper that I did I am representing um, my two co-authors, J.D. Work and Neil Jenkins, today. And we wanted to look at a significant problem in cybersecurity practice that we felt has been under-examined um, through scholarship. We say again and again, or you see again and again in theories and strategies, that we must defenders must impose costs on the attackers that we need to have more disruptions against the adversaries so that we can cause friction. Um, this is central to the new US strategy of persistent engagement. You see it frequently through botnet takedowns. You see it even through naming and shaming. Um, for example, whereas, for example, the Dutch went and released photos of, of GRU hacking teams when they were in the Netherlands. But there hadn't been um, a significant way of looking at the impact of those operations. And so our paper was called Defenders Disrupting Adversaries. And what we did in this, we wanted, we are trying to go for three things in this paper, and not necessarily achieving them all, but at least starting to approach this in a more structured and disciplined way. So first, we have a framework where we said, how can we better talk about, in a repeatable and transparent manner, what we mean when we say um, counter uh, disruptive counter cyber operations? And I'll keep using that phrase, disruptive counter cyber operations. Second, we include uh, four case studies using that framework of some of the, the better known incidents. Um, of disruptive counter cyber operations. And last, and I think perhaps most importantly, uh, we have the first data set of, I believe it's 103 different times when the defenders disrupted adversaries in different ways. Um, we haven't fully coded that data set to the framework, um, but we wanted to get, to get it out there so that um, other researchers can work on it. Um, and again, we think this is uh, especially timely um, now that the United States is saying that such operations are going to form the center of the strategy to cause friction. 
So first, um, let's look at what we mean by that phrase, disruptive counter cyber operations. Again, our, the thing that we think is most important in this paper is starting to give ourselves this transparent and repeatable framework so that we're using words in a similar manner and so that when we disagree, we can at least be disagreeing on the meat of the issue and not the framing. So we said a d disruptive counter cyber operation are positive steps for defeating a specific cyber adversary, usually taken by defenders in response to a specific attack or campaign, often directly disrupt an adversary's technology. The main action is typically either outside of the defender's own network or based on specific intelligence about how that adversary operates. Now that's less a definition than a description. Um, and in the paper, we go through each element of that description to try and pull it apart. In general, we're trying to say it has to be a positive action by the defender. It can't be just, just passive. It should be directed at a specific adversary or specific adversary operation. For example, if you find out like just pushing a new indicator to your, to your firewalls um, that you've been told is helpful, well, we consider that more passive defense. You're doing that for general protection. Versus if you say, we have an election coming up, we know the GRU tends to use these kinds of um, attacks, and therefore these indicators are specifically useful because we have um, to defeat this adversary, um, we're treating as um, uh, more likely to be, to be in scope. So after that, we get into our specific framework. Now, what we're trying to mention, uh, measure, the dependent variable, is the effect and duration of the disruption. And you'll see when you check out the paper on, on the SciCon website um, that we keep these very, very simple. I was going to say generic, but I'll say um, very simple. Measurement, as many of us know, um, is it's very, very difficult. Um, when you're trying to look at um, uh, all things cyber. So we try and keep it as simplified as we can. For example, effect, we're just saying minor, significant, decisive. Duration, days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years, um, and the like. Um, and the independent variables, we look at across different areas. And let me just say, as I'm introducing the, uh, the dependent variable, saying right, look, we're looking at effect and duration. One of the things that was really stuck, particularly in my head, as we looked at this research, was many of you will have seen, oh, last year, 2019, there's an adversary group called Oil Rig, APT, also went by APT34 or Helix Kitten, that was just absolutely dismantled online. Almost everything about this Iranian group um, got revealed online their operations, their persona, their malware. And this really drove me to say, boy, if they are able to bounce back relatively quickly, having been so substantially disassembled online, then that tells us something very, very important about persistent engagement and about disruptive counter cyber operations. If a group is hit that badly and is able to bounce back, it gives us incredibly important lessons. Likewise, or um, contrary-wise, if APT34 oil rig Helix Kitten essentially said, eh, you know what, we just better pack it in. Um, this one-off event was so bad um, that let's just disband the group and, and, and farm the resources out to other places. Again, that teaches us something very, very important. Um, Ned Moran of Microsoft uh, had come out a couple of days ago, um, I'm sorry, a couple of weeks ago, and said it looks like it was actually relatively brief that they were down. So uh, we think this is a very, very important question. We hope our framework is very useful for trying to um, help ask this in a more structured way. Okay. So if the dependent variables are the effects and the duration, um, how badly and how long an adversary is disrupted, on the independent variables, we say, well, what is the type of disruption, right? You can categorize it by the functional object which is targeted or by the action. Like, are you sync calling traffic? Are you seizing control of the adversary's C2 network? 
um, we look at the, the frequency of the disruptive activity. Um, what happened to oil rig APT-34 Helix Kitten was essentially a one-off, right? They get hit really, really badly, but they get hit once. That's very different from what Cyber Command is looking for, right? Cyber Command is looking for a more sustained operation. Um, the, uh, one of our case studies looks at the Configure Working Group, which was going after the Configure malware a decade ago. That was sustained um, uh, uh, constantly um, over the course of 18 months, this constant back, back and forth. Um, the framework also looks at the potential reasons for delay in returning to operations. For example, in many cases, it's just technical, right? Your, your infrastructure, your C2 gets burned, and it just takes you a while to rebuild it. Um, I was talking to uh, one of the very experienced and well-known cyber threat intelligence um, analysts who looked at, um, there was a big F, uh, takedown of, of uh, announcement of adversaries that were in home routers, and he said, boy, you know, if the adversaries had wanted to, they could have reestablished themselves immediately, but they decided not to, right? There's no technical reasons. Um, it was behavioral or bureaucratic. And we also look at, you know, there's political um, or geopolitical, right? Political, maybe if we just say, you know what, that group's not worth it anymore. They're, they're out of favor now. Um, geopolitical, if, they, if the adversary fears the backlash for operating um, in that way again. We think it's very important to look at the, the geopolitical context of the disruption. As we went through the data set, it was quite clear um, that you had different responses, whether we were in a situation of peace, tension, crisis, or, or outright war. Um, last, we looked at the type of adversary, um, both the disrupted actor and the disrupting actor, so that we, because uh, we think that will take, uh, take in be important in a lot of these. So for the different cases, um, I won't get into too many of them. We looked at Code Red. Uh, many of you that might, many of you might not know Code Red. It was back in two, uh, 2001. Um, and uh, in July 2001, it was actually the incident that really helped make my name when I was, when I was um, uh, much younger and working at a bank's computer emergency response team. Um, and so we say that was a, and we look at Code Red in particular because there was a um, there was a white worm that was associated with it. That is, someone had coded a piece of um, malware that went and tried to inoculate systems against Code Red. So you not only had Code Red spreading, but you had someone um, that was writing their own uh, software that would that would patch the hole. Um, we looked at the configure disruption as another case study, which I, which I've already mentioned. Um, Great, great case study and very well documented, um, including by the um, uh, the book Worm, um, which is a full book length uh, expose of exactly how the um, the defenders responded over time. We looked at the Game Over Zeus takedown. Um, clearly, botnet takedowns are one of the one of the most um, uh, compelling aspects of. Of disruptive counter cyber operations, and one of the ones that we have some of the best examples of. And last, we look at the, we call it China related disclosures, but this is everything from the APT1 paper, which came out um, uh, some years ago. Um, and so that we can examine across these case studies and using the framework. Um, those case studies are nice examples. But what we really hope is that we're able, that us and other adver, uh, other um, researchers are able to use the data set here. And right now the data set is just in the PDF version. I'll work with, um, especially JD Work, my co-author that did the most on this aspect of it, um, to get the data set up somewhere, um, either at Columbia or Marine Corps University um, in a more useful format for, for scholars. Um, it's got 103 rows of different uh, disruptive counter cyber operations uh, going back to 1987. Um, most of the cases are within the last, I'll call them five, six years. Um, but as far as we know, this is the first real published data set on this. It is certainly incomplete. Uh, certainly we need to do more work, um, either ourselves or with other researchers and scholars. Um, to build out these data sets, to not just have them as a row with some sources, um, 
but to build them out into a more complete data set. Um, and we look forward to uh, working with many of you for that. I will point out that my, some of my students at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs did a related set of work for their capstone project um, overseen by Neil Pollard uh, that we're looking specifically at the naming and shaming aspect of what happens when an adversary has been named or shamed. Um, and we hope over, over the coming months to be putting these different aspects of the research uh, together in, in one place. So of course, we've got some, uh, some findings listed. Um, and areas for further research, but you can look at the paper on that. Uh, and let me turn it back to Matt. Uh, let me turn it back to Jane. Th thanks very much, and I can't wait to hear from the rest of the panelists and the questions. Jay, thanks so much. But don't worry. To be honest, the moderators are pretty interchangeable, so that's not too much of a problem. <laughs> um, it's a really fantastic uh, bit of research. What I like is that um, Jay does two things really well, which are really hard to do in the same paper and his co-authors as well. The first is to take us back in time, right? He gives us a good history and says, look, this was not something that's just happened over the last year or few years. Disruptive <laughs> counter operations have been happening for a long time. And he encourages researchers, it's a real impatient to go back, look at these historic cases, see what we can learn from them. On the other hand, he also says this is a strategic change. As we know, the uh, strategy of engagement and Defend Forward has prioritized these far above their previous place in the hierarchy of strategic options in the US. So he makes both those points, which are not easy to do together. Our next speaker takes the strategic question of persistent engagement even further. He asks, what can AI add to this? What are the elements of persistent engagement and new strategic questions raised by artificial intelligence? He's a perfect person to do this because he's got a really broad range of research topics in this area. I first uh, encountered his work uh, with an article on monism and dualism in cybersecurity research very aptly and, in uh, my opinion, far too late, bringing Leibniz back into uh, computer science and cybersecurity research. So without any further um, pontificating on my part, I'm going to turn you over to what he's an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, he teaches across um, the whole of security policy, um, political science, and uh, conflict analysis. And he's got a wide range of published work, books, and many articles. And I really encourage you to check them out, as well as the current paper, which we'll talk about now. Chris, it's all yours. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thanks as well, uh, just right off the bat to both sets of my co-panelists for writing such interesting papers. Both of them do uh, uh, different but very, very critical things. Uh, one of which, of course, is the production of a data set, Jay and your colleagues. Um, that is something that is in short supply in the academic side of the cyber conflict studies field. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Kier, his and Kim's paper is... Uh, it's fascinating. I think we've all kind of been asked that compelling question, you know, what if uh, 2016, the political interference in the US elections, which is the paradigm case that people hold up, what if that was AI enabled, right? It's kind of the what if 9-11, you know, the terrorists were cyber savvy, you got a similar kind of compelling question. So I'm, I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, so in the paper um, I published in uh, the proceedings of this year's SciCon, which you can go on uh, the website and find, it's called Problems of Poison. I'm specifically looking at the intersection of cyber operations and developments in artificial intelligence methods. So this is part of a, a pretty broad project for me, but I think the scope of this paper is of um, paramount significance as we begin to think more clearly about the impact of AI systems on cyber. And, and that's because this paper I wrote attempts with you know, policymakers and strategic planners in mind specifically to try to offer um, some categorical breakdowns of what AI will do for offensive cyber, and then to look at strategic implications thereof for national strategy, and particularly with the new persistent engagement approach that's been adopted here in the US in mind. So um, I was particularly thrilled to see that several papers of this year's proceedings uh, look at AI from a variety of perspectives. Um, as most people, as many of the people uh, listening to this almost certainly know, AI is you know, not exclusively something of the future or even the near future. 
AI as this, you know, basket of technologies that link advances in machine learning and reasoning, robotics, automated perception, etc. Um, AI has been used um, in applications across many sectors of industry and society over, you know, the past couple of decades, particularly over the past few years. And at this point, the scientific and industrial field of AI and machine learning research um, is uh, immense. Um, that said, at least within the academic and practitioner communities interested in how AI might transform national security, uh, the research program is um, certainly not non-existent, but it's just not picking up a little bit of speed. Um, and thus far, you know, when I was preparing to submit something for SciCon this year, and I was looking at this project, which it was partly underway at the time, I noticed that you know, remarkably little had been done to apply theory and attempt to assess how AI might actually transform the, you know, the character of the strategic environment in which states have to act to secure um, their national interests. So I think I'm the first of the AI papers, um, uh, you know, at SciCon this year. So um, let me just do the, a very brief, what is AI? And in the interest of time, I'm going to leave the more fleshed out technical discussions to um, the panelists that are going to come over the next couple of days. But broadly, um, I think about AI as a, a field defined by the goal of um, moving beyond the mere programmability of contemporary computer systems to build um, complex thinking constructs that are capable of concept formation, abstract reasoning, environment recognition, and, and specifically um, self-improvement. Um, and since the days of you know, Norbert Weiner and Marvin Minsky and von Neumann and others, we've seen a vast range of these kinds of constructs applied in pretty narrow terms, admittedly, but across pretty much all areas of modern society in some fashion. Um, you know, in terms of how AI is applied, uh, I argue in the paper that the technologies of AI might most simply be thought of as existing across three main categories. So movement, um, sensing and perception, and then machine reasoning and learning. Um, the last of which, of course, machine learning uh, being by far the most revolutionary area within these categories. So machine learning, just very briefly, so whereas you know, conventional computing generically involves you know, putting data into, let's just generically say an algorithm that then outputs some functional result, machine learning involves more um, inputting both data and let's say a desired result to a learner algorithm, you know, a neural network of some one kind or another um, that infers and then it outputs yet another algorithm tailored to allow for intelligent engagement with the subject data. And so what we're talking about with AI here is um, a, an incredibly powerful technology specifically because it doesn't try to solve you know, computational challenges by piling on the processing power or what have you. It's trying to overcome challenges by simplifying or sidestepping these challenges by a process of ongoing reprogramming. So cyber ops. When it comes to cyber operations, the, the conventional wisdom out there is that AI, you know, straightforwardly is going to stand to make both defensive and offensive tools more powerful. Plain and simple. That's it. Um, there's already a pretty large technical body of work on what this kind of upgrading of cyber by AI might look like. Um, uh, there's a, there's a uh, I think it's called DeepLocker. IBM actually created a, a, an example piece of malware um, that was pretty fascinating. It posed as a, um, uh, an internet video, uh, you know, uh, voice over internet protocol uh, application, and then waited until it could visually and audibly recognize its next target before jumping to them. Uh, so there's some pretty interesting examples out there of what this might look like. Um, with offensive cyber, I think it would be fair to say with just a couple of exceptions that we probably want to be thinking about this upgrading of cyber by AI along four lines, um, three of which are pretty interconnected. So the first one, um, AI pretends this, I think, a dramatically improved ability for attackers to probe and to understand the attack surface of a target at some scale. And that, go, that comes in two, uh, two flavors, basically. Um, on the one hand, at the, um, the functional level, smarter malware um, you know, has already been demonstrated to be able to infer from incoming data and assign probability values to the next possible set of target machines. Um, we should also be thinking in, um, from an operations planning perspective, though, um, for instance, might be thinking about the wealth of stolen data that populates criminal spaces. 
you know, given the manner in which you get um, criminal models of operation, often closely mirroring, you know, global digital platform capitalism models, um, an upgrading of analytic capabilities on the part of criminals essentially stands to increase the value of stolen assets for a variety of malicious purposes. And it also probably increases the incentive towards further mass data theft. Back to the operational level, though, um, the second area of AI upgrading, I argue in the paper of, of cyber offensive methods, is um, just the inevitable ability of malware to autonomously select from a toolkit of operations from, for further spread. Um, it's fairly straightforward. It's already a reality to some degree. Um, but relatedly, we should also be worried about AI program malware that it'll inev will inevitably be able to select its own strategies in addition to just simple toolkit selection. Perhaps um, you know, avoiding some uh, patterns of approach to intrusion when given defensive behaviors detected, you know, going low and slow in order to avoid compromise, that kind of thing. Um, and I think the real added value of AI, I will say here, is a perspective leveling of the playing field where we're talking about less well-resourced actors um, finding themselves more relatively capable vis-a-vis -vis sophisticated state and criminal actors that can already do all of the above in a relatively sophisticated fashion. And then finally, of course, defenders face the challenge of malware that's going to be able to compartmentalize itself into you know, different mindsets, essentially. Um, compartmentalizing the lessons uh, a program learns and then applying them differently across different circumstances. But, you know, developments in the offense are going to be matched in many cases by the increasing sophistication of defensive efforts. Um, I just don't think it's, um, I think it's a bit disingenuous basically to characterize the implications of AI upgrading for cyber ops as just a, a tit for tat kind of gradual escalation of improvements for defenders and attackers. Because with AI, we also seriously have to worry about subversion, about you know, cyber AI attacks that target the legitimate functionality of learner techniques that get baked into all manner of system. Um, and in broad strokes, you know, these kind of attacks are going to come in two forms. Um, input attacks, the kind of things that try to mislead AI systems and cause them to intentionally uh, misclassify activity. And then secondly, and this is where the title of the paper comes from, efforts to look to kind of compromise how the AI system itself works, right? To poison the intelligent system so that its model of the environment just doesn't accurately represent reality. So um, there's a few other things I can say there. In the interest of time, um, let me kind of just jump to the final stages of the paper I wrote here. Talk um, specifically about um, persistent engagement. Um, there are obviously distinct implications of um, cyber AI attacks and the AI upgrading of, of, of cyber ops as we conventionally think of them for um, the strategy of cyber conflicts in general. Um, you know, smarter tools exist that can more reliably avoid detection, take lateral routes to target, scale effects more suddenly and quickly than is the norm today. Adversaries are obviously, potentially at least, likely to exhibit increased willingness to continue operation under circumstances they might not have previously. And of course, AI adds uh, new dimensions to the traditional AI, uh, attribution perception problems we have in cyberspace. Um, but with persistent engagement specifically, I think there's some more to be said um, that's of particular relevance given that we're kind of finding our way with the strategy right now. Um, so with persistent engagement, um, the idea is simply that forward operation is going to allow the United States, other countries if they adopt the strategy, to both see attacks before they occur and then to produce friction that increases cost of antagonism for adversaries. So one immediate concern I think with AI is that it pretends kind of a narrowing of the space within which adversaries are probably going to take cost benefit calculations and then come to the belief that the benefits of further action are outweighed by the costs that might be imposed in the domain by forward defenders. Um, so especially given that you know, stakes of uh, defection from agreed com uh, conditions of competition, they're not typically very high in political terms with cyber conflict, at least we think. And I'm actually going to reference a great article that uh, one of my panelists, Jay Healy, wrote in the journal Cybersecurity recently on that front. But particularly given the you know, political costs of defection from these conditions the strategy outlines are probably not particularly high, then this contraction of the space wherein persuasion is argued to be possible ostensibly makes meaningful signaling even more difficult, you know, case by case. And I think this is particularly the case as well, given that there's 
a fundamental limitation uh, contained in the in the strategy of persistent engagement in the contestation is essentially the only method of communication involved, right? Um, AI exacerbates the challenges that this poses. I think in particular, a major challenge is that, you know, failed friction will lead to these aggression spirals in which both sides continue to escalate in search of costly digital territory. Well, AI adds dimensionality to that concern. Um, you know, simplistically, AI is likely to lower the costs of uh, reconstruction of digital assets across the board. And with AI, aggression spirals might actually be somewhat attractive to adversaries, at least uh, under control conditions, or what they believe are control conditions, as they're looking for opportunities to train defensive platforms and defenders themselves to showcase strategies of aggression that are, might be intended to mislead peer competitors, and so on. Um, AI also um, adds a little bit uh, further dimensionality to the question of what acceptable adversary behavior looks like uh, in the domain. Uh, one problem is obviously the centrality of cyberspace for all manner of AI attacks, right? If you want to subvert an AI model linked to something beyond the conventional scope of cyber conflict, you're likely still attacking in the fifth domain. I'm sure you might, you know, attack via uh, you know, physical media insertion, but you're likely going to attack via cyberspace. And so particularly if um, subversive attacks that have increasingly real meaning for strategic knowledge capabilities are imperative for competitors heavily invested in the use of AI, then we're left with this question, I mean, what conventional metrics as we currently have them can possibly be used to gauge um, aggression? Um, and I'll leave this point aside, but I think that's uh, particularly salient uh, in given the, P, uh, the PE strategy holds espionage apart as acceptable behavior. Uh, let me just end with this. I think a final implication for AI uh, for current approaches to cyber conflict is the manner in which you know, efforts to uh, secure cyberspace might degrade the reality of an open and reliable and secure, you know, interoperable internet. Um, cyber strategy in the West uh, and in Western states, um, you know, whether it's PE or something else, tend to naturally rely on a great deal of trust amongst allies, civil society, private sector partners. And with AI, you know, the promise and problem of poisoning the battle space suggests a potentially massive wrinkle for broader Western efforts to head a liberal world order. Um, let me leave that there. Um, again, let me just simply say that um, I don't think the AI itself inevitably uh, means advantages for attackers over defenders or vice versa, but I do think that adversarial learning techniques certainly add complexity to an already complex set of operational conditions in cyberspace. And there are reasons we might uh, think that there will be an uptick in offensive behavior along several lines you know, as we go forward. And with that, let me, let me pass it back over to you, James and uh, and uh, cut myself off there. Chris, thanks so much. It's such a rich paper and you did a great job of uh, doing justice to it in that very short time, but I really encourage everyone who's watching to check it out, get into the detail. One of the things it does really well is really have a nuanced uh, idea of how AI will affect cyber operations in different ways for different threat groups and for different offenders, right? um, defenders. Some will benefit more than others. Some are already doing this kind of thing, and it changes the cost benefit source investment around the whole environment. To go to our last paper, maybe if the connection between Chris's paper was persistent engagement and questions of strategy, the connection between Chris's paper and Kier's paper is in this idea of AI and the difficult questions it raises about the adoption of new systems and the potential for the subversion of those systems um, and how both defenders and offenders and offensive actors can um, both use new techniques for uh, intrusion and influence, but they can also be undermined by adopting those new techniques. Kier is a um, stalwart in the field. He's been uh, researching this for many years and has produced many of the finest works on cyber conflict that I've known and relied on uh, throughout. Um, he's a fellow at Chatham House, director at the Conflict Studies Center. Um, he has a great focus on especially uh, Russian uh, actions in this domain as well, but I'll uh, leave uh, Kier to explain more about his paper and introduce you to his work in more detail. So Kier, over to you. 
James, thanks you very much for that intro. It's, it's great to join this all-star cast. And actually, this panel has been set up really well because it allows me to, to take some of the principles that Christopher introduced and then apply them to one of those specific domains, James, that you just mentioned of online confrontation. And in this case, it is malign influence, subversion, and destabilization through disinformation. Now, the paper in the proceedings was written jointly by me and Kim Hartman. Kim is a computer scientist, and I'm a professional pessimist about malign influence. So when we work together, we tend to end up with fairly dystopian results. In this particular case, we wanted to look at whether machine learning and AI would transform the techniques and capabilities and reach and impact, especially of disinformation and information warfare overall. And we think that, yes, the, the effect could be transformative. Because up until this point, Online malign influence and disinformation campaigns have primarily been operated and directed manually or with the assistance of relatively crude and simple bots because the design, the production, dissemination of material has been processed by humans. But the trend of utilizing AI methods to compose manipulated or fake material that we observed during 2019 shows that it's possible to automate the processes that are needed to successfully operate this information campaigns. Because if we think back over that last year, we saw rapid developments in the use of machine learning techniques to assist and amplify malign influence efforts. Early in the year, Katie Jones on LinkedIn was the first publicly identified instance of a deep fake face used in a social media campaign. By the end of the year, by December, this technique had gone mainstream. It was mass use in a campaign to influence U.S. politics across Facebook that really brought this to more widespread attention. So what we see is in the disinformation arms race, the capabilities that are available to malign actors are developing and proliferating at a hugely unprecedented rate. Already, as Christopher just referred to, malign influence campaigns which leverage cyber capabilities have caused significant political upheaval in the United States and elsewhere, but the next generation of campaigns could be considerably more damaging by adopting machine learning for far greater automation and scaling. Plus, there'll be more players in the field because machine learning is no longer an exquisite technology that's available only to actors with enormous resources. It's been democratized and commodified. It's no longer just nation states that can access it because it's commercially available or in some cases at the lower levels for free. So campaigns will no longer depend on labor intensive human interaction with their targets. If we think back to the 2010s, a successful disinformation campaign needed humans at every stage. The concept had to be developed and the material needed to be designed and drafted and generated and spread through social media platforms. And that dissemination required the utilization of profiles which needed to be created in advance of the campaign, often manually. Then those profiles needed to be serviced by humans in order to build those social networks, generate followers and establish their credibility. But the introduction of machine learning and potentially artificial intelligence overall will vastly enhance those capabilities for automating the reaching of mass audiences with tailored and plausible content. And that is going to render malicious actors even more powerful. Now, bots and processes on most social media platforms have become relatively easy to develop, largely because they allow developers to interact with the platform through developer APIs. And since Control panels for automated postings on social media are a mature and widely and cheaply available and broadly accepted technology. It can't be that far off the development of command and control panels for disinformation operations should be expected. Combining those with parallel developments in machine learning makes it likely that they are going to control intelligent bots, which are capable of generating artificial content semi-automatically. And the benefits are obvious for malign actors. It's a potentially unlimited number of accounts across multiple social media platforms that can be orchestrated by one individual through one single application, spreading content generated by artificial intelligence pursuing one single and coordinated goal. Of course, plausibility won't be perfect when it is machines that are trying to convince humans, but then plausibility isn't often a criterion of success. Now, at the present moment, we are studying a, a malicious profile on LinkedIn, which is so wildly implausible that uh, nobody that examines it for more than a couple of seconds will think it's a real human. And yet, it has reeled in targets from Atlantic Council, Chatham House, Rand, uh, 
quite a few from Rand. In fact, uh, hilariously for us, Rand's chief information security officer has fallen for this blatantly fake profile, and we're just trying to figure out how exactly that connection is going to be leveraged. But also, people who want to be convinced will embrace the most transparent fake. Current political developments show that masses of people can be impervious to evidence when they want to practice self-deception in order to keep the faith. So machine learning and AI may be increasing in plausibility, they'll never be perfect, but what they are perfect for is scalability. They're ideally suited to that, to scaling up across massive numbers, processes which previously were labor intensive. That also applies to some level of deepfakes, to creating entirely new artificial individuals. Because the challenge is simpler if you're creating somebody new. You just have to make content convincingly realistic as opposed to convincingly like a real person. So generating a chimera that is capable of convincing viewers that they're interacting with a real individual is very easy now to scale and to replicate with campaigns at close to zero cost, which could be aimed simply at inducing the most careless or gullible individual out of a target set to click on the link or astroturfing through mass, fraudulently generating messages and profiles which are designed to give the impression of widespread support for an idea, to generate this impression of political consensus in order that elected leaders in democracies are swayed into new policies. But even the production of deceptive text by output by machine learning systems is potentially highly dangerous. In the early part of the last decade, Russia found that automated systems were inadequate to influence debate on domestic or international fora and social media, and human intervention in the form of professional trolls was required. But now, with the development of intelligent fake text, trolls could finally face replacement by automated systems for all but the most sophisticated of interactions with real humans. And astroturfing with text becomes vastly easier when it's not necessary to manually craft each message or even each seed from which messages are developed. And the result of this automation could be once again a massive scaling up of operations, generating an entire fake public to influence political decisions, potentially to the point where the fake public drowns out the voices of real human individuals. The pace of development is absolutely staggering. So what do we see in the paper, Kim and I, when we look into the near future? Near ubiquitous deepfakes in the form of video or audio or still image as accessibility of deepfake production continues to increase. Developments in human computer interface science, especially in the field of emotional modeling, which might potentially allow deepfakes to generate real time, lifelike responses to live interactions. It's that intelligent engagement that Christopher was referring to, but with humans as opposed to with data. Or, even more easily than that, the alteration of video to include simulated inappropriate emotional reactions to discredit public figures, especially as the changes made might be extremely simple and subtle and hard to detect, far harder than a straightforward overall deepfake. A simple example could be a politician discussing a military operation that claimed civilian victims, but with his altered to show indifference or even approval. And AI-generated text, allowing bots to adapt their approaches dependent on human reactions and auto-generate narratives, facilitating instant disinformation to develop responses to developing situations. Because an intelligent information warfare campaign should be able to identify the rising interest in a relevant topic or event and generate a coordinated automatic response to leverage that interest. And those response patterns could include producing counter arguments or fake news or trolling or simple cheap propaganda. But again, it's on a mass scale and it is tailored to individual recipients. But then it would also respond in interactions, taking cues from how human targets react to the information and adjusting strategies in real time to maximize their effect. It could also change what disinformation is actually used for. Current online counterfactual disinformation efforts, particularly by Russia, tend to focus on trying to convince people that something has not happened. A particular event has not taken place. Russian troops are not where they in fact are. They have not done what they in fact have. AI could facilitate the opposite, convincing masses of people and Western politicians that something has happened when it in fact did not. It could make this vastly easier than has been the case to date. And in addition, the capability to convincingly reproduce the voice of known individuals could revolutionize principles of social engineering. We've already seen fraud undertaken by replicating the voice of chief executive officers of companies, 
How much further will it be before we hear the same thing applied to replicating the voices of commanding officers of military units? There are implications for individuals and companies as well as for countries as a whole because private citizens face several different layers of risk when they are facing this kind of technology. High visibility individuals might be exploited and targeted in order to deceive others or to attack their reputation, but less prominent people are also at risk, although of a different form. That's because, as well as high-profile national security implications, there's also potential here for simple fraud in use against individuals and corporations, especially, for example, where financial services providers and manufacturers of connected devices rely increasingly on voice and face recognition to authenticate their customers. In an environment where both voices and faces can be not just imitated but replicated, that risk is becoming no more secure than the text-based authentication passwords they were supposed to replace. We will continue to hear dramatic predictions of the consequences of abuse of AI for political purposes. Some of those are justified and some of them are a little overwrought. But there's another parallel process we need to bear in mind, and that is normalization of this technology, driven by the increasing and widely accepted prevalence of virtual individuals, especially for marketing purposes. And I'm going to leave you with an open question. There's a side effect of this with unpredictable social consequences, and that is the continuing erosion of confidence in whether any online interaction that you have as a real person is in fact with another real person, as opposed to a bot, an intelligent agent, a virtual individual. And the question I would like to throw open to everybody is, does this predict major social change? It is a problem, or will it simply become an acceptable part of our online existence in the same way as so many other seemingly dramatic changes have been normalized in the past? Thank you very much, James. Back to you. Thanks, Kier. That's a yeah, fantastic uh, investigation of just some of the problems that we face in terms of influence and artificial intelligence in especially modern democratic societies. And what Keir does really well, uh, in my view, is show that these sort of uh, state-sponsored influence operations are part of a much broader social question. Artificial intelligence, deep fakes in terms of vi voice and images has implications across society from gendered relations, from uh, democratic structures, and also economic consequences as well. And one of the questions is whether the types of platform governance and social governance solutions that can be applied across these different areas will also work for influence operations conducted by hostile states. I'm going to move on to the first of our questions now, and it goes directly to Jay. Uh, so first up in the papers and also first up in the questions. Uh, the question is, how are the attribution requirements for disruptive counter cyber operations different to other forms of cost imposition. Uh, thank it's you, James, and, 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 thanks, and thanks to the other panelists for the great comments. It really depends on what kind of disruptor counter cyber operations we're talking about. Um, in many cases, right, like look at Conficker, right? Here was one of the longest continual active counter cyber operations that we had lasting for, what, a, a year and a half. Um, and they never had an idea of who they, whom they were countering. Um, you know, it was only it was only much later that uh, we had arrests. They were there actively engaged um, in trying to stop um, the malware and the adversaries behind the malware with zero sense of attribution of who was responsible. In many of the cases that we're looking at. Um, you're countering, or the defenders were countering the malware, the command and control um, software um, itself, rather than trying to go after a, a known adversary. In other cases, for example, in indictments uh, that we include quite a few of them in, uh, in the paper, well, there obviously you have to have it down to persona. Uh, involved and even better than just persona, the organizational affiliation of those people. Um, so that way you can not just name and shame a person, but you can tie it more directly to the government involved. So, um, and that's what we hope are the kinds of things that can come out of this paper is looking at where you have to have attribution for it and where it is, ju and where it is just a nice plus. 
Fantastic. Um, and yeah, and this question of attribution and how far it's necessary should always be put in the context of saying there are many kinds of attribution, right? There's attribution performed for legal, for political purposes, and also technical attribution. So we can get very deep into that um, topic very quickly. I want to move on to uh, Chris and ask you a question about the possibility for upgrading deceptive defensive um, actions in terms of the, the use of artificial intelligence. If we think that artificial intelligence systems can be subverted, can be poisoned, is there a possibility for deceptive operations within defenders' networks to try and poison attackers' artificial intelligence systems, or is that something you don't see as a realistic possibility? Thanks, thanks for the question. It's, it's a really good one. I, I do see it as a possibility. Um, you know, as I, I say in the paper, um, I think um, adopting some kind of basic assumption of a tit-for-tat gradual escalation of sophistication on both the offense and the defense um, is somewhat reasonable uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to the AI upgrading of cyber. Um, but there are, there are problems, and the reason I chose to focus on the strategic level here is you have these problems of adversarial learning, um, the metaphor of the, the generative adversarial uh, network, which is at the heart of the deep fakes that are uh, discussed in Kier's paper, are a really good kind of metaphor for what I'm talking about here. Um, as you know, one side gets better, the other side inevitably tries to, um, uh, to, to, to compromise uh, the, the upgrading that is just, uh, they, try, they try to balance essentially against the offender or the defender effort. Um, but, you know, the real issue I see here is the kind of poisoning of the game itself. Um, if you have this situation where um, a game is being played between two sides, um, but much of the play begins to focus on poisoning the basic rule set, then you have an odd situation where actors are no longer necessarily, um, you know, safe in committing to the parameters of strategic engagement that they have that they initially have laid out before them. Um, I think an, an interesting thing with um, AI and particularly with these kind of cyber AI attacks, not just you know cyber operations um, upgraded by um, with machine learning, but um, actual attacks, uh, input attacks, but particularly poisoning attacks themselves, you potentially have this scenario where much low intensity engagement um, becomes prospectively, um, much more threatening to the core uh, functional capabilities of the national security enterprise, way beyond what is currently the case. And so you get this situation there where I think strategists may be forced to either by demonstration or by explicit declaration attempt to begin to offer tighter definitions of what activities are acceptable on the part of, of the adversary. And I, I certainly think a part of that in the next um, decade is uh, that we'll see is uh, strategists trying to figure out how they can demonstrate um, what is acceptable in a way that parses apart espionage, which under the, the current version of the strategy is kind of held apart as okay uh, from poisoning operations and that kind of thing. Um, and all this, I, th I personally think all this seems pretty likely, right? Because the logic of persistent engagement emerges in trusting an invisible you know, hand of market correction, um, which works to produce behavioral equilibrium. Um, the strategy would surely fail, though, if, again, trust in the integrity of the hand flags. Um, you know, actors, again, have to understand the limits of the game they're playing, and the threat of a subverted rule set is going to motivate assertive action to stabilize the battle space. And so, it's again, it's not necessarily a question of can the defenders counter the attackers with their own sophistication of defensive efforts. Absolutely, they can. It's, it's a strategic question about the nature of the game being played. And that's a fantastic point, and one that links very closely to Kier's paper in terms of overall trust in the environment we're in, whether it's a conflictual international space of operations conducted by different actors, or and more broadly, the information environment that we interact with as societies in the modern age. So for Kier, the next question is really on this distinction between inside and outside in terms of information operations and artificial intelligence enabled influence. We see a lot of information influence operations at the moment pick up on and exploit existing social divisions. How will the sort of, and also we see 
actors inside societies, inside countries, use the same techniques as those outside them as well for influence. How does this sort of domestic and foreign interference relationship work for artificial intelligence enabled influence? Okay, we can't hear. Classic mistake, thank you. One of the underlying principles that's common to all of the different issues that that's just opened up is that some things don't change. The pace of technological development and the arms race in technical terms might be breathtaking, but a lot of this relies on unchanging principles. Uh, whether it's deterrence, as Christopher was just alluding to, it's not just the technical side of it, but also the, the interaction between the two sides. Or in the case of disinformation uh, and malign influence, it's human nature, it's human susceptibilities that they play on. And as you just mentioned, riding already existing social tensions as opposed to inventing them from scratch. It's a, going to be a vastly more complicated uh, environment. In fact, it already is a vastly more complicated environment because not only have the tools for waging this kind of warfare been democratized, but also there are more actors that are willing to engage in them. So if we think of the, the toxic super spreaders of disinformation, as you just alluded to, it is not just nation states that are seeking to subvert and erode and undermine social cohesion and liberal democracies in order to weaken them. It's actually elected political figures in those countries themselves that are weaponizing the same techniques against their own population with no visible signs of restraint. So why would they not adopt and embrace new tools as they become available? Put it all together and you get a vastly more messy and complex environment within which not just individuals, but those who seek to defend democratic principles have to thread their way through and find out just what exactly is really happening and what to do about it. Put it all together. And in fact, you have a situation where there are layers upon layers of complexity when divining that, uh, that last point that, um, that I made. Who are you talking to? Are they telling the truth? Where is the truth? How can you find it? It's going to be become enormously more challenging. And of course, a case in point that uh, that proves the um, proves the point, if you like, is what's happening at the moment with online radicalization, with the pandemic, where people retreat more to online worlds and are deprived of that interaction with real individuals, deprived of that social interaction that so often provides a reality check when they're being fed false information online. The pace of radicalization and the pace at which all of these disinformation campaigns moving forward is vastly accelerated. I think that is a harbinger of what we may be facing in the not too distant future, pandemic or no pandemic, when there are so many different influences leveraging so many different technologies to look, make it look as though there is a convincing consensus in an online environment in favor of one particular position. So I did mention at the beginning, our research tends to lead to dystopian conclusions. I would very much like somebody to prove me wrong. Um, here, uh, me too. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, and our final question is going to go back to Jay, and it's going to go back on the tactical level. Uh, you mentioned a bit about counter cyber operations, and that you see these disruptive uh, operations taking two forms. One is leaks into the public domain, a rig where there these are actors that are named or shamed, and the public know all their activities. Another one is actually trying to target infrastructure and really stop them doing what they're doing. Do you see these as two really different courses of action or are they more the same, you know, with the same strategic effects? Mm. Uh, it's certainly related. Um, they're, they're, they're not brother and sister, but they're, but they're certainly cousins. And so what we were trying to do in the paper is to associate all of these together so that we can take the parts of them that are similar, right, of trying to take active measures on your own to influence the adversary's behavior or disrupt their operations. Um, and even there, you can see part of the difference, right? It, some of these are aimed at behavior. Some of them are aimed at decision making. It's aimed at trying to change things that's happening in the adversary's head. Well, that's very different from a bot and a takedown. You have you don't care necessarily who your adversary is or what's going on in their head. You're trying to directly stop the technology. Um, one is more policy. One is more operations. Um, but that is absolutely okay. We can we can take what these things have in common, so that defenders can look across the have a larger toolbox 
to say, okay, we might not have, per the last question, really strong attribution. We have to take these tools and put them to one side for now, yet we still have this rich set of other tools which we, which we can rely on. Um, if you know your adversary is doing something, but you can't be quite sure exactly what, well, then that one set of tools you can't use and you have to depend on, on these others um, that are relying on uh, that are looking to influence what's happening uh, in their in their minds. Some of this work had been done before, like the pyramid of pain or other areas. Um, but we're trying to unite it a little bit more, especially for scholars. That's fantastic. Um, and with that, I have to draw to a close. I really like to thank our phenomenal panelists, Jay Healy, Chris White, and Keir Giles. I really encourage you to read the papers. There's so much in them that we couldn't cover now, but thanks and a virtual round of applause to everyone involved. Thank you. And from Tallinn, um, thank you to uh, the moderator, uh, Professor Shires, and the panelists for uh, providing us with this uh, highly interesting and thought-provoking session to round off our strategy policy day of the virtual book launch of the Saigon Proceedings. Also, of course, uh, thanks to the audience for listening in. Uh, we hope that the sessions in the following days will be uh, equally interesting. I, too, would like to express my thanks. And we hope to see you again tomorrow for the legal sessions at 1600 Eastern European time. So stay tuned and have a nice day or have a nice evening. <laughs>